Like Mike said, my name is Jill Wellborn, and I, am the, I get the privilege of working here every day as a director of student development. And my OCC story began in 2006 as a student, like many of you, and I know I'm dating myself, but that's okay. And I remember getting together with my roommates freshman year, eager to pack our boxes and heading to Dollar Tree and trying out all the toys and all the toys in the aisles, which maybe we looked a little silly, but we were excited. And so flash forward 10 years through my student leadership experiences and time in the Leonard Center, and I continue to get to serve OCC um, through my role now. And through all these perspectives that I've had, I'm convinced that we're a school dedicated and passionate about the mission of this organization. So last Christmas, I got a call from Mike asking if I wanted to go to the Dominican Republic on an OCC box distribution trip. And I said, let me think about that. I don't know if I want to go to a tropical country in January when it's cold. I think I'd rather stay in my office and work on a computer. Obviously, that wasn't my response. I was very excited um, to head to the Dominican. And in fact, it was an honor because I know so many of you students, so many staff and faculty in the room have paved the way for me to have this opportunity. So in January, I boarded a plane for the Dominican Republic to a city called Puerto Plata. And I struggle with rolling my R's, but that is the name of the city. Anxious that I might be out of my comfort zone at times and slightly nervous that maybe I built up this experience for 10 years and it wasn't really going to be what I expected it. So however, from the second that I stepped off the plane and met the OCC staff to start our journey, I felt nothing less than the love of God evident in every single specific action that this organization took. So we were in the country for three days, and I got to participate in four different distribution trips and one discipleship event. So on the screen are a few pictures representative of the experience, and they'll be scrolling throughout my two brief stories. The first was our second outreach event at a church located where there was a high drug and crime rate and a lot of the students end up actually dropping out of school. It was a simple church with plastic chairs and no air conditioning and the doors and windows were open and you could hear the sounds of the city entering in the church walls, uh, especially the popular motorcycle taxis um, that all entered our service. And I think there's a picture on the screen. The seats were filled with children, and the walls were lined with eager parents who were listening intently to the drama ministry and gospel presentation shared by the local church leaders. But after the presentation, it was shoebox time, and we would pass out gifts one by one <coughs> to each child. The smoke, you guys, outside. It's rough. So at this time, I got to sit with a young girl named Melissa, who was 14 years old. I was drawn to her as she reminded me of many of the young girls in my husband's youth group, trying to remain cool, calm, and collected, yet nervously excited, sitting there. And I sat with her as she opened her box, and she kept trying to give me things in her box. She wanted to share with me her lollipop. She wanted me to try on her new scarf. And her generosity touched me. And her interest in my life was more than I expected. <laughs> She practiced her English she was learning in school, and I practiced my Spanish from Dr. Ortega's class about eight years ago. It wasn't that impressive, but it, we were still able to communicate. And we exchanged information and have been modern day pen pals or Facebook friends ever since. And her, intentional, her intentionality continued. Not only did she wanna share her box with me, but she wanted to share her life. And in fact, she sent me this card via Facebook on my birthday. She wrote me a little note and took a picture of it and sent it to me. And it was extremely touching. <coughs> you know, oftentimes we go into our service experiences expecting to give of ourselves and to sacrifice ourselves, but we end up being the ones that are ministered to. So I told Melissa that I was going to be sharing about her today, and she wanted me to say hello and ask that you pray for the rain to cease in the area because they're dealing with a lot of flooding. Um, so I told her that I would definitely let you guys know that and ask you to pray. So another story I'll share is one that happened um, to a gentleman on my distribution team. He shared a story of a 10-year-old boy that took the time when he was opening his gift to examine each and every specific item 
And as he would take them out one by one, he would give an audible ooh or an audible ah, something that you could hear. He was so excited about that one little pencil or that one little coloring book. (coughs) And when he got to the bottom of the box, there were a couple pairs of socks. And with each sock, he unraveled, um, he unrolled them, and he brought them to his face, and he hugged them, and he kissed them individually. And you can see a picture on the screen. Yeah, if that doesn't get you, I don't know what will, because it got me. And it showed me just how much I take for granted. Um, Yet he taught me the joy in the smallest of things. And so this trip opened my eyes to the empowerment that OCC offers to the local church. These pastors and church leaders have very little financial resources to do outreach events, um, but when Samaritan's Purse partners with them, they give them the opportunity to invite the community to something, obviously where they're given children's gifts, but they're sharing the gospel. And beyond the gift distribution day, beyond the gift distribution day, they're given a discipleship tool called the Greatest Journey. And so this is a 12-week course for kids to continue their walk with Christ and connect with the local church and their leadership. So it's not just about the gift. They don't just come in and leave. Um, It's about the greatest gift and the journey that follows after that. They are truly the heroes in the local community. So if I could leave you with anything today, it's to reiterate what Mike said at the beginning, but that every box represents a child. So when I hear that our campus is trying to pack 3,000 boxes, I see 3,000 Melissa's, or 3,000 little boys excited about his pair of socks. And And it's so much more than just the hygiene items and the candy and the toys. It's an invitation to a life altering experience with Christ, and it's an invitation to hope. That's what this trip was for me. It was a chance to hope and see that hope through a child's eyes. So at this time, we're going to watch a video by OCC of college students across the country um, participating in this program, and you might see a few familiar faces and places. And then following the video without further introduction, we have the privilege of hearing from my new friend, Alex Sinjamana. And he is what they call a, a full circle speaker. He was originally from Rwanda, and he'll be sharing with you today about his story of when he received his shoebox. So take a look at the video. As younger people, we want to know how we can impact the world. And a lot of times we don't really know how. My grandmother told me, she said, you know, you really should consider coming on as a year-round volunteer. That's actually a thing. A lot of kids my age think that after I graduate high school, after I graduate college, or when I become an adult, then I can, you know, try to make an impact on the world. But you don't have to wait until you're past those marks in your life. You can start now. I am so stoked right now. This is incredible. The amount of just effort and love and just resources and time and sacrifice poured into this by the students on this campus has just been overwhelming. This is gospel opportunities on both ends of the box. Today we're here at Lee University having an Operation Christmas Child packing party. Back here are over 800 freshmen and all together they have packed over a thousand shoe boxes. Shoe boxes! I think it's so important for young college students to be involved with OCC because we have so much energy and just fire and we're, we're ready to go and we're that next generation. We're gonna be the ones here recruiting college students later. I can touch a part of the world without having to physically go there. It's so special that one box can change a child's life And to me, that's the most important thing. When we look at Operation Christmas Child, it's great when we have the huge numbers. You know, we we can say we pack, you know, millions of boxes. But to me, what's really big about the program is the idea of that one box changing one child's life. And it's such a big, big change that the box is going to make. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you so much for having me this morning and give me an opportunity to share uh, what the Lord has done uh, in my life through Operation Christmas Child. 
Uh, thank you again for all your involvement. I, uh, when I saw the hands go up of each and every person who has packed the shoebox in the last, uh, since you came to this school, it's just uh, a blessing for me to see because on the other side there's a child who received your shoebox. And actually that shoebox then just touched that child. It touched their families, touched their friends because they were excited with, to receive that good news and they were excited to share it with other people. So I wanna, I wanna, before we begin, let me say a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. I pray that as I share my testimony, it may not be about me, Father, but it will be about bringing glory to you. And I will thank you so much for all the kids who are receiving these boxes from uh, uh, Lee University and how Lee University is taking the lead in uh, changing children's lives around the world. Father, may you speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I was born and raised in the country of Rwanda, and many of you know about Rwanda and the history that took place there in 1994, when uh, from April 6th to July 4th, about a million people lost their lives and over 400,000 orphans were left by this war. As a six-year-old, six I was raised by my grandmother, and my mother passed away of HIV AIDS, and I, knew, I never knew my father, and so I had a great relationship with my grandmother. But at this point, the hatred that was created between the Hutus and the Tutsis was so great that actually a neighbor killed a neighbor. And I remember when we, uh, when we woke up one morning on April 6th and we had noises and I, I didn't know what had happened the night before. And I remember counting uh, to up to 21, counting noises, boom, boom. And those were no, uh, bombs going off from a distance and I had no idea. But our neighbor came to us and said, hey, the, the president of Rwanda was assassinated last night. Do not leave the place. Do not leave your house because if you leave, they may come, you may not make it because there's roadblocks everywhere and you may get killed. So we were so scared and my grandmother who had survived the hatred over the years, back in, 19, in 1959 there was a pre-genocide where a lot of people fled, uh, including the, the president today at that point was a young boy. And so all this hatred over the years, my grandmother had seen it, knew about it, and so she told us to hide right away. We hid for that morning, and it was late afternoon, we came back to our house. We, we went into the house and closed all the doors, and that's when it would be attacked by these militias. And they would come, and they would say, all of you go outside and lie down. And we, we would do what they wanted. They would send us kids, uh, me and my brother and my sister, back in the house. And that's when they would take our grandmother's life. And we would be wondering, as a six-year-old watching this happen, wondering why would a neighbor all of a sudden just turn their backs on us and just because we're different, just because we look different, just because we're tall and slim. And, and that's, those are the things that they made up in order to distinguish the people. They, they said, if you're very tall and you're very slim, you have a pointy nose, they, that means you're a Tutsi. So th they made up these distinctions, and during the war, they used that to dehumanize the people. So we have two uncles living with us, and one of the uncles was known to be the one who would provide for us, and so they would come back looking for him, and they would also take his life, and he would be there just in tears again, just so lost, uh, couldn't fathom that this is happening to, to our family. The other uncle who was left would bribe the militias for the following week, and when he had no money left, he would come to us and tell us, you need to leave this place, you need to run, because if you stay here, they're gonna come back and I cannot stop them. So we went into the city, we lived with our aunt, and while we were there in the city, it turned for the worst also. And my aunt and her husband were protecting about 20, uh, no, about 19 people who had come from the village. Now they, they needed to do something to protect the family, so they decided to uh, sell uh, what I joke that was a banana beer, a banana moonshine uh, in their living room. But they, was, they were selling this beer just so they can get some money to provide for the family. And so they do that, and these men would come in the, back, in the living room, but one of them managed to make into the backyard, and he threatened the whole family. And he said, all of you lie down. He went to load his weapon, and all of a sudden his magazine fell out. And that's what saved their lives. This whole time, the Lord is performing so many miracles, and I am counting these miracles as coincidences, and we know very well there's nothing coincidence with the Lord. And because my little faith that I had was my grandmother's. By watching that happen to my grandmother, that faith shattered. So eventually the city turned for the worse, and we packed up and we started to run. 
We ran for a period of two months, but I will never forget one of the many miracles that God performed to save my life. As a little boy, just running and um, hearing this noise coming from a distance and didn't know what the noise was, about 2,000 people were all running from all directions. And I slipped down and I fell, and when I fell, I just happened to go away from this noise. And that noise happened to be a bullet and missed my head just by an inch because I had slipped in a cow pie. And that's what the Lord used to save my life. I never thought I would be telling people that God used a cow pie to save my life, but uh, <laughs> there's nothing glamorous about that at all. It's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord used it. I don't tell that to gross you out. I tell that to show you the power of God and what he can do. A God who takes something very gross like that to save someone's life. Something that we take for granted, even he, he, he's a humorous God. So never underestimate the power of God and what he can do. I tell that to help you see that uh, he can use anything, even that little box, the, the, the little items that you put in a shoebox. He takes it and uses it for, uh, to bring hope and, and, and love to a child. So at the end of the war, I was put in an orphanage. And while I was in this orphanage, that's when Samaritan's Prayers came to respond to what was happening. Because you know very well, if you've seen the videos on Samaritan's Prayers website, you know they respond to disasters both here domestically and internationally. And at that point, in 1994, the Rwandan genocide was the biggest uh, um, disaster happening in, in the world. So they came to Rwanda. They wanted to do something for the orphans and the people who were wounded physically. So they brought Operation Christmas Child. They had just taken on the project in 1993, and they, they delivered these shoeboxes to us, and they say, I remember when they told us to line up in the yard, and they said, do not open your gifts until all of them have been handed out. For some of us, we had hold our presents for five minutes, and it was just five, five long minutes for a seven-year-old to hold, to hold their present. But when he got to open it, all of us were screaming, not because someone was trying to chase us, take our lives, but he was screaming because we could not contain our joy the joy of receiving a gift for the, for the very first time. And so as I opened my shoebox, I saw the school supplies, the hygiene items, the little toy cars, and uh, these little socks and underwears and uh, all these fun items. I can still remember the way they smelled, the way the things felt, but also we had no idea what some of, some of the items were. And uh, if you were at, in the gym uh, during the parking party, um, you, you remember what I, what I shared with you about the Smarties, that we had no idea where they were. And we thought the Smarties were medicine, so we would throw them back in the box. And, uh, <clears throat> but we, some of us, would, we would wait, uh, and wait for the little ones to try one of the Smarties. <laughs> and if nothing happened to them, then the rest of us would eat ours. <laughs> I, uh, I love sharing that part. It actually happened. <laughs> we just kind of wait until uh, one of those curious ones would eat one. But my favorite item in that shoebox, in all the items that it was, to me at this point, um, I didn't know what this item was. I had, I had smelt it, I had felt it, I didn't know what to do it, so I decided to eat it. And I ate it with a wrapper on it. And that was my first time eating a candy cane. And up to today, every time I see a candy cane, I remember receiving my Operation Christmas Child gift. A gift that came when I was just lost, uh, left no, with no hope, that gift took our minds off from the nightmares we're having because now that we're not running physically for our lives, our minds were running and we're recalling everything that happened through the war. And so as we opened that gift, we just, uh, it just we felt special. But a year later, I get to join a choir called the African Children's Choir and I was taken to Uganda. And while I was in Uganda, this is when the Lord really started to get a hold of my heart. I was blaming the Lord for everything that happened in my life and I missed out on the miracles that he did to save my life. So as a, as a nine-year-old, sitting in, in, in Uganda and asking myself, why me? Why am I alive today? Why did God create me? How can a God who created all of us in his own image sit and watch while a million of his children are being killed in Rwanda? Why would he watch while my grandmother and my uncle are being killed? Why would he take away my mother when, uh, wh when I was very little? Why, he, why did he not introduce me to my father? So I was so lost and asking these questions all the time, and I missed out on the miracles. And so I remember, as I was reading the Bible in my native language, Kinyarwanda, and in little English I knew at that point, 
I came to this verse, and I want to share this verse with you. You know it very well. You probably have studied it, and you've probably memorized it. But think, as a nine-year-old, I don't even know the history of the Israelites. I don't even know the history of uh, this prophet. But I'm just a nine-year-old, and I'm lost, and I'm searching. This is the words that I read. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. That's why I give you the context. Probably you've had this verse being you know, blown out of proportion or being used out of context. But as a nine-year-old, not knowing the history of the Israelites, these are the words I read. That, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans of welfare, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, as a nine-year-old, just reading those words, not even knowing who the Israelites were, I started to study, just wanted to find out who the Israelites were and who Jeremiah was. And in, in, in me trying to find that out, I saw that along the way, the Israelites prayed for God to deliver them. He delivered them. They walked on dry land in the middle of a sea, and they soon forgot about that miracle. And then they cried out for food and water in the, in the desert. God provided them food and water. They soon forgot about those miracles. They went on to make a God for themselves to worship. I, blamed, I looked at my own life, and I realized I was, I was doing exactly the same thing. I spent so much time of my life blaming the Lord for everything that happened in the war that I missed out on the miracle that actually when I was born, my mother had HIV AIDS and I could have gotten the virus, but I didn't. When my grandmother and my uncle were both killed, the distance were from that piano to where I am. There was no any wall to shelter me from what was happening. When I was running and sleeping on a cow pie and a bullet missing my head by an inch, just a split second, when that man's weapon didn't load when he went to pull the trigger, when going to an orphanage and receiving a shoebox, a gift that really reminded me of his love, why did those people pack those boxes? And a question that I always ask is, why do you pack those boxes? For the very first time, I saw God's presence that was with me, and I could not ignore that. And that's when I started to pray, Lord, help me to heal then. Help me to heal so that I can be able to meet even the people who caused me so much pain. And in this prayer, I prayed for 12 years. And within these 12 years, that's when I got uh, adopted into an American family in 2003. And I would return to the United States, and then that's when I would pack boxes. And then in 2013, I traveled. Uh, I went to Boone, North Carolina, and that's where I am today. I work in, to be an ambassador for so many children who have yet to receive a gift, a life-changing gift. But also on that, in that year, uh, God opened an opportunity for me to travel with Operation Christmas Child back to the orphanage that I grew up in to deliver shoeboxes. And it was so special to be able to, op- to see the kids there open a gift for the very first time. But on that trip, the Lord chose to answer my prayer. Lord, help me to heal to the point where I can be able to sit with the person who has caused me the most pain. And I'm very careful on how I share details of my testimonies. I don't want people to always think, oh, look at Alex, what he did, and look what happened. But I just want to be very careful. I prayed for 12 years for God to heal me, and my healing process is still going on up to today. But on that trip, this was my second time trying to figure this, to find out. Uh, we went to the prison, and we found out that the man who had killed my grandmother flee but the man who had killed my uncle was still there. And a process that would have taken about three weeks, about three hours, we were able to meet with this man. They actually, the director of the, of the prison escorted us to, to meet this man and we were able to ask him, why did you do what you did? And he would say, I don't rem- we don't know what the things we did, we're just following orders. And I would ask him, do you remember me? And he would say, I don't rem- remember specifically, but I remember three children being there. In that moment, I would just lose it, and I would be in tears. But I know that in that moment, also, the Lord healed me, and my healing process went to a different level. But you may be wondering, why in the world am I sharing this with you? I'm sharing this with you because all the seeds that, that came from in my life, that I'm here where I am today, came from someone who decided to pack one little box, who planted seeds of hope and love in my life. And that's what you're doing. I tell my testimony not to show, look what I've done, but to give glory for what is done. And a verse that just communicates my heart really well of why I share my testimony is Psalms 105, verse 1 through 6, where it says, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all the wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he's done, 
and his miracles and judgment that he altered. I tell you my testimony to share with you the wondrous works that he's done, not only in my life, but in your life. Think from the day you were born, along the way, the many miracles that has happened in your life, the cow pies that he's laid in front of you, you slipped in and you, did, you didn't even know it. The miracles he's done, the pain that has been caused you along the way since you were born, but how also that pain doesn't have to define who you are, but it was what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're sharing with these kids. So when you pack that box, that's what you're doing. It's planting seeds of hope and love in these kids' lives. But I want to ask you and share a, um, a question that was asked to me before uh, I head out. And that's the question, Alex, what if you would sit with the person who has caused you the most pain in your life? What would you do? So take a brief moment. If you may be tuned out, just bear with me. As you sit there, Think of a person who has caused the most pain in your life. Could be a boss, could be a classmate, could be your ex, could be your parents. Who is a person who has caused you the most pain in your life? Only you know them. What if you left school today and you had to spend the rest of the day with them? What would you do? I'm not here to say that I've gotten better, that I'm done, that I'm better than you guys. I'm not here to say that, oh, look at Alex, what he's done. My healing process will always go on. And I'll, my healing process will go, always go on. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm not done. And I'm, I'm inviting you to join me on this journey. Like, the pain has been caused you. The pain has been caused me in, the, in, the, in that war. I will never forget it. The pain has been caused you. You will never forget it. But that has, doesn't have to define who you are. But it's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But that person is also creating an image of God. And God loved them just as much as he loves you. And that's something that took me a long time to understand. So I hope and pray that you cannot define yourself by the pain that has been caused you. As you share that love with this, these children through these shoeboxes, that you can also receive that love yourself. Because it would be so sad for you to spend time packing those boxes, sending the love, and you forget the love yourself and you don't have that love yourself. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share that with you. And may God bless you. Thank you so much, Alex. Appreciate your vulnerability and your sharing with us. It is truly uh, an inspirational story, and I hope that you are inspired to continue to make a difference. We have one more day to collect boxes on campus. If you'd like to pack a box, we actually have empty boxes out in the lobby. And again, remember that the university covers all the shipping charges. If you'll get a box and you'll bring it to the Office of Student Development, the house just across from the Con Center, we'll be happy to get that taken care of for you. I've got a couple of other quick announcements. If you are here during the Thanksgiving break, not everyone can go somewhere. Uh, some of y'all are actually uh, local students. We want to invite you to a special Thanksgiving lunch next Friday at noon in the Centenary Room. It is an amazing meal. Uh, all the food you can eat, all the fixings, plus a lot of really cool giveaways. But here's the idea, we need to prepare enough food and make sure that we got the space for you. So, Andrea Campbell works in the president's office. We would love for as many of you who can to join us. This is a great time for you to connect. Obviously, a lot of the dining facilities are closed over the Thanksgiving break, so please let Andrea Campbell in the president's office know you can email or you can go by. Also, tonight, Maroon Madness, it's an event for our athletic teams, specifically our men's and women's basketball teams. It is a chance to meet the players. So tonight at 6.30 in Walker Arena, you can meet and greet the players. And I think the most important thing on that slide is free bacon, right? Can I get an amen? All right, free bacon to everybody who comes. Also, free, free t-shirts to the first 100 students. And here's the biggie. Two chances to win scholarships of $2,500. Half court shot contest, show up, you might be able to sink it, it'll be great. If you would, please stand with me and let's say the college benediction. Again, thank you, Alex, and thank you for over 30,000 Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Let us pray together. 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Have a great day.